Hello YouTube, this is Frugal and welcome to the first in a very long time of fully loaded flights with PMDG's 737NGX. Now the reason I'm doing this is, as many of you know, I'm a beta tester for PMDG and we are testing the 737NGX for both FSX Steam Edition and of course for Prepared. Now on top of that, a number of you have been asking me to do F videos in FSX Steam Edition, so there's a good reason to do a, do a video in that platform. And also I'm surprised at how many requests I still get saying how do I plan a flight, how do I program a flight, how do I power up the aircraft. So there's another excuse to do this video. And also I wanted to do it as a bit of a challenge to myself. Those of you who are long time viewers will know that in the past when I've done fully loaded videos, I normally have FS to crew sitting in the right hand seat helping me out. FS to crew is an automated voice controlled co-pilot who flicks switches and manages checklists for me and uh, reduces the workload quite a lot on myself. I've never actually done a video without him in terms of the NGX or even the Dash 8 or the, sorry, I have for the Dash 8 or the 777 or the Airbus and so on. So I figured let's, it's time to return to the fully loaded and I will walk you through the entire process. I'll get on to exactly what fully loaded means in a little while, but before we get there, let's go ahead and plan this flight. Now I found a flight that I want to do. Alaska Airlines Flight 65 is a scheduled flight that happens every single day between Juneau in Alaska and Anchorage in Alaska. It's about an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and 30 minutes in length, so not too harsh. It happens in the daytime, we're making it ideal for filming, and we're going to go ahead and do that. So I've got found this flight on, flight on Flight Aware. I put up a video showing how to find flights on Flight Aware, and that's where I found this one. You can see it takes place at 1.32 Alaskan time in the afternoon, lands at 2.59 Alaskan time in the afternoon as well. So the first challenge of course is how do we use historical weather so here's the first part of fully loaded when I do a fully loaded video I normally have multiple computers and I always have a ton of add-ons not doing multiple computers today but I am doing the ton of add-ons the first one of course is active sky next we need to set up active sky next to manage the the weather today on the 25th I think today is I'm not sure um, at those specific times so here's what we do we'll fire up active sky next there you can see it's currently in live weather mode so i'm going to switch that into historical and what we will say is it's the 26th today not the 25th thursday the 26th of february now utc that's pretty much london time alaska is eight hours behind so if we were to set this to be 20 hundred which is eight o'clock at night utc then that's going to match pretty much noon alaska time which is very close to the time of this actual flight so we've done that we set up historical weather the next thing we need to do is actually plan the flight. Now I'm going to be using Aerosoft's PFPX because I love it for managing and planning airliner flights and doing the whole dispatch thing for airliners. If you don't have it, you can use simbrief.com. There's a link in the show notes below and that's a completely free service that you all can use. I, however, am using PFPX. So what we need to do is fire up PFPX, there it is, and make sure that it is using Active Sky as its weather source. Now hopefully this hasn't crashed on me. It looks like it might have. It has. It's actually crashed on me. Good. So let's go ahead and run PFPX once again. Here it comes. Excellent. Live on video. I'm not going to edit that out. <laughs> There's going to be enough edits coming, I'm sure, as I struggle to fly this aircraft on my own. Loading the airways, loading the procedures. Okay. It should pop up any second. When it pops up, normally PFPX uses its own weather service. You can see I tried to plan this flight earlier didn't go too well. It's currently using Active Sky Next. I will show you how to set that up. If you go down here, click on the globe, click on weather, and then click on setup, you'll see there's a number of options in here. Click on Active Sky, and then find where it stores the current weather. And on my computer, I think, I might be wrong on this, but I think it's in Hi-Fi, Active Sky Next, and it's in weather. Okay, not snapshot or anything like that. I'm fairly sure it's weather. Click on OK, and you'll see this icon at the bottom here, indicate Active Sky Next. The next thing we need to do is add our aircraft to the aircraft database. I'm also going to be using, here's the next part. We've already gone through two applications, PFPX, Active Sky Next. I'm also using TopCat. TopCat is a, uh, an add-on for figuring out the performance of an aircraft. So how much to derate the engine on takeoff so that we preserve their life and don't overstress them. You don't need it. You can do this flight without TopCat, without any issue. Just derate to derate to takeoff one or two and away you go. We are going to be using it though. So Click on new, add a new aircraft and type in the registration. The Alaskan Airlines 
800 that I'm going to be flying is November 553 Alpha Sierra. So November 553 Alpha Sierra. Click in here the type of aircraft, so a Boeing 737-800, that one. The weights are going to be in pounds, lengths are measured in feet. That's really all we need to do here. Um, if you are unfamiliar with what all these things here mean, if you're a PFPX user, don't worry, so am I. I will be doing a video once I figure out what they are. Now we go into Top Cat. Click on Edit and choose the aircraft that we're going to be flying, which is the 737-800 right there. Click on Apply. It loads it up. We're all set. With all that done, we can click on Save, save the aircraft, and we have a brand new aircraft. So having added the aircraft to the aircraft database, click on Flight up here. Let's go ahead and plan this. So Alaskan. ASA, flight number 65. We are flying from Juno, Papa Alpha Juliet November, to Papa Alpha November Charlie, like so. And based on the weather it's currently picking up, it's saying we're going to be taking off runway 26, so heading to the west, landing runway 33. Great. Let's key in our commercial flight number, which I think is AS65, and we'll choose the aircraft we just added in here. Once you choose that, it will automatically populate all this stuff for you. That's all great, don't have to worry about it. Payload, we'll set a random payload, just like a real pilot would have. They never know the payload until they turn up to go fly the flight. We'll click on fuel. We're gonna be following the US domestic fuel policy, but we are gonna take 30 minutes extra time and 30 minutes hold time um, and add those onto our fuel planning, just in case the weather turns nasty. Now for our route, we could just type in the route that we have from Flight Aware, but I like to just click on Find, and there is our route. So the ASORT 2 SID out of Juno to the ASORT waypoint, then Ju uh, yeah, Juliet 541 Airway to Yak, Juliet 501 Airway to JOH, and then the Witty 1 Star into Anchorage. Next up, we'll choose our alternate down here. We're looking for something with a fairly long runway that isn't too far away. That one works pretty well. So Papa Alpha Echo November, we'll double click that. And again, find the route. Done. Now we'll go to the Top Cat part. If you have Top Cat, if you don't, don't worry. But if you do have Top Cat, click on take off. It will pop up this little dialogue, which is basically talking to Top Cat. And we click on calculate. And it's calculated our takeoff conditions. So we're going to be flaps one takeoff, assuming a temperature of five degrees C. Is that correct? No, that's the current temperature. Oh, there we go. So takeoff thrust, it's not derating at all. It's gonna be takeoff thrust, flap, flaps one, outside air temperature is five degrees C. Runway is currently dry, air conditioning will be on, anti-ice will be off for this. So having calculated that, we click on apply, and that adds it into our flight plan. Now we'll click on landing, get an idea of what landing looks like. And again, we're gonna be flaps 40, it will be a manual landing, air conditioning on, uh, anti-ice, temperature is minus four. We might actually have anti-ice on, I'm not sure. Um, for now, we'll say that it's gonna be off. Um, anti-ice is not necessarily required because of a negative temperature, it's required because of moisture. And looking here at the weather, we've got scattered clouds. Hmm, yeah, I think it's, there's a strong likelihood actually anti-ice will be on, because there are scattered clouds fairly low, broken clouds at 20,000 feet. 10 miles visibility. Okay, let's turn this on. Engine and wing. And calculate. Okay, so anti-ice will be on, air conditioning will be on, manual landing, flaps 40. And if we scroll down here, it's going to give us our speeds as well. So V-Ref is 142, V-Approach is 147. Wonderful stuff. And there's our braking configuration. So with uh, auto brake set at level 2, it's saying 6,840 feet to land. Hmm, might need to go max on that. But anyway, let's click on apply. And that adds that into our flight plan. With all that done, we can compute the flight. It should turn green if there are no errors. We'll update the performance data, like so. And then we can go ahead and release the flight. Now, normally at this point, you could click on export. And with SimBrief, there's an export function as well from the website. But in PFPX, you can click on export and it will output a route that you can load in as a company route into the NGX. Just highlight PMDG here and here, um, and away you go. We'll export those, but we're not going to use those. I'm going to show you how to manually set up the flight in the aircraft. So having done all that, the last thing you probably want to do is print it. So I'll click on print now. You'll hear my printer whir into life as it prints out tons of paper with our flight plan. And I will also go ahead and print out to a PDF so that we can look at it during uh, the video here as well. So it's going to print that out. Great, great, great. 
let's open the document after creation and I can show you what the flight plan looks like. So that's done here. So let's zoom out a little bit. So here's our flight plan. Ignore the times on the flight plan. We're going to be flying whenever we want because we're using historical weather. But you can see here our release fuel, 19,540 uh, pounds of fuel for release. So we're all good there. Our reserves are 4.1, so 4,100. Our zero fuel weight, we're going to need that to set up the aircraft as well, is 134,248 pounds, which is 165 plus one passengers. So we're all good there. Here is our flight plan. Departing from Juneau, runway 26, landing in Anchorage, runway 33. Airport elevation at Juneau is 25 feet. We are landing at 151 feet. Our altitude for the cruise is going to be 340 or flight level 340, so that's all cool. Here's our takeoff data. We are having, actually, my mistake, a D-rated takeoff and an assumed temperature of 34 degrees. So D-rated takeoff number two, 34 degrees there. Anti-ice will be off, air conditioning will be on, giving us a V1 of 151, VR of 152, V2 of 156. Hopefully that matches up to the numbers the PMGG aircraft will give us shortly. Landing, we're expecting anti-ice engine and wing to be on. We will recheck these numbers in the cockpit as we come into landing, but right now it's looking like a VRF of 142 and a V approach of 147. All good there. Beyond that, we have our route here, and then further down here we have our waypoints. Now, normally when you're flying, you would match all this stuff up. So as we line up on the runway to take off, we'll hit the stopwatch, and then as we hit each of these waypoints here, we'll match the time, so this is the expected time, then we write the actual time underneath, and we'll match the fuel as well. How much fuel did we use, or how much fuel is remaining, and see if we're going to be late, and if we're burning too much fuel, or not enough, and so on, and so on, and so on. So having done all of that, the last thing we need to look at, if we go back over to FlightAware, it said that this aircraft departed from Gate 5. With the Orbex Juno scenery I'm using, I don't have a Gate 5, I have a Gate 1, which is pretty handy. So we'll be going from gate one, and we know from the flight plan we're taking that, uh, where is my flight plan? We're taking that ASORT2 SID. So let's bring up Navigraph Charts. There's the next app we're going to be using. I like Navigraph Charts. They don't sponsor me or anything. I just genuinely love their service and pay for it and love it. So here is Anchor, uh, Juno, sorry, not Anchorage. We are going to be parked right around here. We're expecting to take off on runway 26, so down here. So we will be pushing back. If we can, we'll be pushing back with the nose to the right, tail to the left, and then we'll probably go Charlie 1, Alpha, all the way down to Golf, and then join runway 26 for departure. So that's our aerodrome information, which we should also print as well. I will do that. And then ASORT 2, this is the SID, a very, very simple SID. So taking off from this runway, you can see there's a number of VORs that we can tune to cross-check where we're at, in particular this one and this one on the route, and then this one on probably NAV 2 just to check the radials and see where we're at in various positions. Um, looks very, very simple. Uh, at or above 1,000 feet at this waypoint, that's the only altitude constraint until we get over here, which is at or above 10,000 feet at that one. So pretty simple. Let's read information down here as well. Our transition altitude is 18,000 feet, pretty standard. And it says, from runway 26, turn left onto a heading of 252 to CGL. Where is CGL? That waypoint right there via IJDL West Course or 251 from CGL. Okay, great, great, great. Everything's good. And then the only altitude constraint is cushy minimum 10,000 feet. Everything looks lovely. So start climbing as soon as we take off towards 10,000 feet and we should be in good shape. Very, very simple. With all that done, with all that planned, with all that set up, the only thing that remains now is to get into the aircraft and power it up. So I will see you in the flight deck in a moment. Now, quick addendum before we get in the flight deck, I did actually miss a step, and that step is to load the flight plan into Active Sky Next, otherwise you can't use ATIS to figure out the destination weather. So make sure when you export that you do set up your FSX folder here, you do set up your document folder here, and you do export a Microsoft Flight Simulator X flight plan. If you've done all of that and click on save and it shows no errors there, then you should be able to go into Active Sky Next, click on flight plan, and then click on load, okay? There's the one we just exported, so click on open that. It will load that flight plan in, and now you can tune ATIS at the destination airport in flight, which is going to be very handy for us. Don't forget to do that if you're an Active Sky Next user. Okay, so time now to go ahead and set this aircraft up. Now, before we get into that, let me talk about some of the add ons that are running. I'm changing my view here with EasyDock, that's something I use in almost all of my videos on FSX, and prepared now. 
We are at Orbex's PAJN, Papa Alpha Juliet November, which is Juneau Airport in Alaska. Also using Orbex's Alaska scenery and Orbex FTS Global. The textures up in the sky uh, and on the ground somewhat are being provided by uh, Rex4 Texture Direct and the clouds are from Rex Soft Clouds. So quite a few add-ons running there. In addition to that, of course, the PMDG 737 NGX and I'm using FSUIPC for my controls. Now, the aircraft is set up in a short turnaround state. It's actually a slightly modified turnaround state in that uh, PMDG's default short turnaround state doesn't have a GPU connected, that ground power unit right there. I like to use that. So I have a state set up which has the APU off, has the GPU on, and other than that, it's pretty much what you would expect to find on an aircraft that's in a short turnaround phase. So we need to get in to the flight deck here and start setting things up. So let's go ahead and do just that. Now before we actually get into setting up the aircraft itself, we need to go ahead and tell PMDG's version of this aircraft a few key parts of uh, information which we got from our flight plan. Now you remember earlier in the video I was using PFPX for my flight planning. You also could use simbrief.com which is a free website and it will give you pretty much the same information that I'm about to use here now. So first thing I need to do is tell it how much fuel I'm carrying. So we go into FS Actions, we click on Fuel, and I look at my release fuel. My release fuel for this trip is 19,540. So 19540. We'll put that up in here. Next up, the payload. Now in the NGX videos I did on this channel previously, I always used to mess around with the passengers, say how many were in first class, how many were in coach. You don't actually need to do that. I chose a random payload in PFPX and all I'm interested in really is something called the zero fuel weight. That's the weight of the aircraft with the payload on board, so all the people, all the bags and everything else, but without any fuel. So the zero fuel weight of this aircraft is 134,248 pounds or 134.2 since we do zero fuel weight in thousands of pounds up here. So we type in 134.2, click on zero fuel weight and that sets up the weight of the aircraft. With all that done, click on FMC to return to normal operation and we can go ahead and set this bird up ready to fly. Now because it's in a short turnaround state, the supplementary electrical power-up procedure has already been done and the supplementary electrical standby power tests have also been done. So we need to dive straight into the preliminary pre-flight procedure on the overhead panel. Now I'm working from printed checklist here and flows. You can also get them from PMDG's own documentation which you can access from the operations center. So if you have the most recent update to the NGX, which you should have if you're running on Steam Edition or prepared, then just fire up the operations center, click on the NGX in there, click on documentation and you'll find all the PDF manuals, all 3,000 pages of them. So first thing we need to do is go up here. These are the two IRSs, or Inertial Reference Systems. They are two computers, one's obviously redundant, and uh, they, could, they handle plotting our position on the globe as we start to fly around, They're using GPS and all sorts of other wonderful, magical stuff. So what you do is we're gonna turn this right one here, sorry, this left one here to the right, two clicks, and it will say on DC, and then the on DC light will go out. Like so. Now it's aligning. When it's aligned, as in it's got a good GPS signal, it will start to flash. We don't worry about that just yet. Click on the next one, do the same thing. Now next up in the checklist is a few items that we actually don't need to worry about because it's a SIM. For example, the voice recorder switch, so we'll ignore that. Look at the oxygen pressure. It's pretty high, so we're good on that. Now we go and look at the hydraulic pressure. Now that's down here. We whiz on over here, and you see the screen down here. If you click on System, it will show you down here hydraulic levels. So 92% on system A, 96 on system B. Pressures are pretty much even, we're good to go there. Now we need to check the engine oil quantity. We do that by clicking the engine button here. And you can see our engine oil quantity, 18 in the left, 20 in the right. So we're pretty good, we're pretty even there. Maintenance documents, we don't worry about. Flight deck access system switch, we don't worry about. Emergency equipment, we don't worry about. So we can whiz back on up to that overhead where we did the alignment and just check some lights are out. So in particular, we're looking for the PSEU light. This one should be out. The GPS light here should be out. The service interphone switch up here should be off. So there should be no light there. And then we can go ahead and check the engine panel, which is right here. And what we do with the engine panel is to make sure that these two reversal lights are both out, which they are. And we make sure that the engine control lights are also out, which they are, and the EEC switches have this plastic cover on top of them, which they currently do. 
With that done, go back down to our pilot's flying view, make sure the landing gear lever is down and we have three green lights. And that's really all there is to do other than setting the parking brake. The rest of it doesn't really apply to the sim. So checking that the circuit breakers are all set, the manual gear extension access door is closed and so on and so on. So our next step then is really to set up the CDU and our navigation for this route. Now the way we do that is actually very easy. I could, since I'm using PFPX, in fact you can do it with SimBrief as well, you can export a file which you can then load into the CDU as the company route. I'm not going to do that, I'm going to do it the somewhat harder way of manually keying everything in because I get a lot of questions saying how do you set up a Boeing CDU, a Boeing um, Central Display Unit, an FMS, Flight Management System. It's very, very straightforward indeed. First of all, come down here and you'll see there's a message saying enter IRS position. So click on position in it here. We will tell it where we are at, which is Papa Alpha Juliet November. Now some airports, add-on scenery, don't work if you put in the gate number here. You know, the, the gate number doesn't give us any additional information. For example, I am at gate one, and if I key that in, I get an error, not in database. Which isn't a big deal. All we need to do is click on next page. You'll see we're on page one of four. Click on next page, and you can see here GPS left and GPS right. Both those coordinates are exactly the same as they should be. So click on one, go previous page, and then where it says set IRS position, click it. And that sets up our initial position. So the aircraft now knows where we are. With that done, click that bottom right LSK again and go to set in the route. Now you notice because we set in a reference uh, airport of Juno, it's already populated Juno here. So we'll click that at the top and we're going to Papa Alpha November Charlie. Now we are Alaska Flight 65 or ASA 65, so we might as well go ahead and set that up. We'll put that into the flight number. We're not using company route, and we do expect to be taking off on runway 26 today. We'll double check that when we get into checking the barometric pressure and the weather, but for now we'll presume 26. With that done, you'll see up here, page one of two. Click on next page to go to the second page, and you'll see there are two fields here, via and two. Via is the jetway or airway that you're going to use to get to a waypoint. The waypoints are typically GPS waypoints or named waypoints that the aircraft's navigation database is fully aware of. Now looking at our route, our first waypoint, it says in the route there, ASORT 2, well that's the star that we're going to follow, sorry, the SID that we're going to follow when we leave Juno. So we ignore that one and our first waypoint is actually ASORT, A-S-O-R-T. So we'll type that in, A-S-O-R-T. Simple. And you'll see that it then specifies an airway, Juliet 541. So that's the via that comes next. Now looking at the route, it says Juliet 541 to Fakes, and there's a GPS reference there, then Juliet 541 to Yak. So we can just skip entering Fakes here and just type in Yak, because it's the same airway all the way through. After Yak, we follow Juliet 501. all the way out to Juliet Oscar Hotel. And we're done. That's it. That's all there is to it on this very simple route. Click on Activate, click on Execute, and you'll get another option come up down the bottom here for Performance Initialization. So we'll click on that. Now, oops, I clicked it twice. Now our Performance Initialization, we need to tell the CDU here our zero fuel weight, how much reserve fuel we expect to have, and our cost index. So zero fuel weight, we double click it, it will load that in. Our reserve fuel from our flight plan is 4,100, so 4.1. Now, cost index is a somewhat arbitrary number. Every airline, not aircraft, every airline uses a different cost index per aircraft. They're not typically set as standard for all Boeings flying this route use this context, cost index. It really is dependent on the airline. And it, depend, it determines how fuel efficient the aircraft is in cruise. So a higher number like 99 would be very inefficient with fuel in a cruise, it would basically be going full speed. Most airlines would never do that, they like to save money, so we're going to presume that our cost index is somewhere around 25, which is a fairly typical number for a 737 NGX, or NG I should say. Now cruise altitude from the flight plan today is flight level 3, 4, 0. Everything else in here looks good, we're not going to worry about the wind at cruise 
it's not a big deal in flying this this sim. Our transition altitude is 18,000 feet, so we're in America, so that's fine. And again, click the bottom right LSK to set the N1 limits. Now, this is the engine limits for takeoff. Again, in the same way that most airlines use a fairly low cost index or whatever they can get away with in cruise to preserve fuel, they tend to derate the engines. So they run the engines at a lower maximum level of performance on takeoff. It prolongs the life of the, en of the engine. It lengthens the period of time between maintenance intervals. Then it's generally a good thing. When I calculated my takeoff data using TopCat with PFPX, I actually came up with a figure of uh, derated takeoff number two and an assumed temperature of 34 degrees. So that's a standard derate here, number two, which derates the engine a standard amount. And by putting in an assumed temperature, that derated a little bit more. I don't know all the details of derates. I can't fully explain them, but that's the numbers I've got. That's the numbers I'm gonna use. And with all that done, we'll click on that bottom right LSK again, the next step, and go to takeoff. We will be doing a Flaps 5 takeoff today. Our center of gravity, the computer will tell us what that is if we double click this button. 25.4, giving us a trim of 5.33, which we'll set up later on. And our V-speeds, well, our V-speeds don't fully match what TopCat gave us. We'll take the aircraft's ones every time. So V1 of 145, V-rotate of 146, and V2, our climbing speed of 149. So we're all good. That's all there is to it. There's nothing else to do. Well, kind of. We do have in our flight plan an assumed SID, and we do have an assumed star, and we do have an assumed landing runway. Now, from PFPX in my flight plan, the landing runway is 33. I have since checked everything out. I'm actually going to choose to land runway 07 left based on weather that I looked at a little while ago. So let's go ahead and set all that stuff in as well. So departures and arrivals. Click on departures and arrivals. The top line, Juno, we've got departure and arrival. Now the reason there's an arrival entry next to Juno is basically if we need to return home. So if we take off and we lose an engine or something, it's very quickly, very easy to just press departures and arrivals and very quickly set an arrival procedure to fly back to Juno. For now, we just need the departure. So the departure is the ASORT 2 SID off runway 26 and execute. Click on departure and arrivals again into Anchorage, click on Arrival. We're gonna take the ILS runway 07 left. And this will be, looking at our flight plan, the Witty 1. So click on Next Page, there's Witty 1. Now again, looking at our flight plan, our final waypoint on the flight plan is Julia Oscar Hotel. So that's our transition. That's the waypoint that we are transitioning from into the star. So we'll select that. This transition is the waypoint from the end of the star to the approach for the runway. We're going to leave that off for now. We could go with ENA, looking at the charts, that works, but it doesn't really matter. We can uh, vector manually or use ATC. We're not going to use ATC, but you get the idea. And finally, click on Execute. All that's left in uh, checking everything out down here is to just check our route. So we'll click on Legs and then scroll through. There are six pages of waypoints. We just make sure that they are all somewhat realistic. And the first way we do that is actually looking at the chart for the star. So I've got this on paper, but I'll pop it up from the other computer on the screen right now. So looking at the star that we have on paper, it says that at uh, CGL, Charlie Golf Lima, we want to be at or above 1,000 feet. So there's Charlie Golf Lima there, and the computers have us at 1,400 feet and climbing, so we're going to be fine on that one. The next constraint we have is at Cushy or Charlie Uniform Sierra Hotel India, which says at or above 10,000 feet. So let's go to the next page. There's Cushy, 10,000 feet at or above. So we're all good there. So everything here on that uh, star looks fine. We'll check, sorry, that SID. I keep on getting the two terms confused. That SID is fine. The star will double check as we start, as we plan for our descent. But what we want to do right now is just run through here and make sure everything matches our printed flight plan, which it does. Notice that fakes got inserted there for us and make sure that there are no discontinuities, and so far, there are none. And you can see here we are, vectoring down to the approach, and the approach to runway 07 left, and if everything goes horribly wrong, then we're gonna do this, then this, and then this, and that's our missed approach procedure. So that's all in there as well. So all good there. Click on init ref, click on N N1 limit, and then take off ref, leave it on there, and now we can go back to setting up the rest of the aircraft. Now the next phase, of setting up the Boeing 737NG is the preliminary pre-flight procedure, which happens up here on the overhead. Now, I used to be quite intimidated by this. Having done nearly all my flights with FS to crew, it's the first officer that manages most of this setup. 
and I never normally have to, so pretty intimidating at first, but it's really quite easy. Like in many aircraft, the overhead is split into strips. So there's strip one, strip two, strip three, four, and five. And what we do is we work down each strip in order. So we go down there, and then we'll go down here, then we'll go down here, and so on and so on. It's actually very, very logical. The things that can catch you out are just double checking lights and uh, warnings and all those usual things that people on live streams and other YouTube videos tend to ignore. So the first thing we do, we checked on our flight control switches, these two, the black guards are down and that there are low pressure lights lit up, which they currently are. Moving on, we look at the flight spoiler switches, these two, make sure their guards are closed, and then the yaw damper switch. So we're going to switch that on and we should see the yaw damper light go out, which it just did. Now the alternate flaps master switch, that um, reddish guard should be down and the alternate position switch should be in the off position, which is right in the middle, that's all fine. And then we just go through and check that all these lights here are out. So low quality tan by hydraulics, low pressure, and so on. Um, field differential pr pressure right there, speed trim fail, and so on. All these lights all need to be out, except for those two. Moving on down, VHF nav switch needs to be in normal. Navigation IRS switch needs to be normal. Navigation FMC transfer switch should be normal. Notice that most of these actually are. If you have the aircraft in that short turnaround state, everything is pretty much done for you, but it doesn't hurt to double check as you'll see in a second, because I know that the fuel switches are wrong, for example, looking at them right now. The crossfeed selector, sorry, display source selector, this one, should be in the auto position. The display control panel selector should be in the normal or middle position. And the crossfeed selector underneath this one should also be in the closed position which is pointing straight up and then we verify that the valve open indicator light is out which it is next up fuel pump switches make sure that they are we're running off the gpu not the apu so these can all be off at this point we will need one on when we start the auxiliary power unit the battery switch now second panel working down there's the battery switch the guards should be closed the cab util switch, cabin utilities switch should be on. The IFE passenger seatbelt sign should be on here. Standby power, guard should be closed. And we should see the standby power off and battery discharge indicator lights both being out, which they are. Generator drive disconnect switches, these two, should both have those red guards down and we should see drive indicator lights lit up above them, which we do. The bus transfer switch now moving down, this one should be guards closed. And then we check that the transfer bus lights, basically all of these lights here, these top four lights are all out, but the gen off bus lights are lit. Equipment cooling switches should both be in the normal position, which means both up. Emergency exit light switch should be guard closed, that one, and we should see not armed unlit, as in there's not a warning that it's not armed. Passenger signs now, we set those, we'll set them to auto. And then with that done, we check the windshield wipers are both in the park position, which they are. Then moving up to the top of the next panel, we'll presume the previous crew did the window heat overheat test, because it's a short turnaround state again. But all the window heat switches, one, two, three, and four should be on. We should see four green lights. The probe heat switches, heat switches should be off. And either side of those heat switches, four amber lights all lit up. Moving down, wing anti-ice should be off. Engine anti-ice should be off. All the warning lights should also be off. Now the hydraulics pumps. There are two sets of hydraulic pump switches. System A on the left, system B on the right, and within each system there are engine and electrical hydraulic pumps. So engine, electrical, electrical engine. So the engine hydraulic pump switches should both be on. And the electrical hydraulic pump switches should both be off and you will see four low pressure lights and the overheat lights will be out. Now moving up to the top of the next panel, nothing else to do down here. Make sure the trim air switch is in that down position on. This switch here, many people get that confused with temperature selector, it's not. That's actually a temperature reading. If I switch, switch through this, you'll see this needle change. It's taking a reading of the temperature in various different parts of the aircraft. That's just the information display. The temperature selectors are down here, and we'll leave those all in the auto position. Recirculation fans, this one and this one, should both be in auto. The isolation valve switch, this one, 
should be in the open position. It has three positions. Up is closed, middle is also down is open, so it should be open. Engine bleeds, this one and this one should both be on. APU bleed can be on even though we don't need it. And we should see a dual bleed light. Now the reason we don't see a dual bleed light right now is because the APU is not running. We want to double check that when we start the APU and make sure that we do see dual bleeds lit up there. Cabin pressurization now. Our cruise altitude today is flight level 340, so we'll dial that up here. We can leave the landing altitude as it is for now. And our pressurization selector should be in the auto position. Next, landing lights, they should all be up and off. Runway turnoff lights should be off. Taxi lights should be off. The uh, ignition select switch here can be either left or right. Never put it usually in both. I'm going to have it on left today and the engine start switches should both be off, which they currently are. Logo light switch can be off, position light switch should be in the steady position, which it currently is. Anti-collision light switch should be off, wing and wheel well lights are also off. Okay, now we can go down to the MCP area, right here, and start setting this up. Course selectors, we're not going to worry about course, everything's going to be handled by the uh, auto flight system, navigation system, the CDU and the FMS. We're not going to be following a radial course at any point in time, but we will at this point turn the flight director switches, this one and this one on. You turn on the captain side first, that makes the captain side the authority. So that's on and that's on. We do have a constraint of 10,000 feet, so we'll leave that 10,000 in there right now. And although this isn't in a checklist at this point, I like to do it now. I will go ahead and set in our V2 speed, which is 149 as our indicated airspeed hold. And we do know from the star that we're going to be flying a heading of 251, so we'll dial that in. Okay, so with our, our heading and our speed set up and our altitude, let's go on over to the left here to the EFIS panel. We'll set this up. I like to have FPV on, which is a flight path vector. It shows me the deviation from where I'm pointing and where I'm heading based on crosswinds and stuff like that. We will arm the VOR indicator here and here. We'll change this range down to give us a more sane route. That's an interesting little loop there that will go away once we, take, once we actually start taking off. So that's all good, we're all set up down here. The next thing to do is to grab the correct barometric pressure. Now I'm using Active Sky Next for the weather, so I can just tune 122 to pick up the ATIS. That's not the radio, that is. So 122.00. Papa, Alpha, now here Juliet, ages. November, airport information, Golf 1, Niner, 5, 3, Zulu, weather, wind, 2, 2, 1, at 4, visibility, 1, 0, sky condition, few clouds at 7,000, temperature, 5, dew point, 1, altimeter, 3, 0, 3, 3, advice on initial contact, you have information, Golf, Papa, Alpha. So 3033 3, and the winds do indicate we are taking the right runway, which is runway 26. So we'll dial in the barometric pressure at 3033 3, 3 here. Three, zero, three, three. That is all good. And I think now we're good to go on that. So the next thing to do, we'll do, just because it's fun, the captain oxygen test. That's all working. We don't have an electronic flight bag, so we don't need to reset that. The clock looks just fine. Now we go through these switches. Nose wheel steering switch should be guard closed. Main panel display unit selector here should be normal. The lower display unit selector should also be normal. Takeoff config light is out, so we're all good there. Now we can do the lights test. There are two sets of tests here. We'll do this one first. Make sure that those lights come on as they do. Make sure those lights come on as they do. And then hold this one in the out position and just check around, make sure that no bulbs are out. All the lights that should be on are on. And we're good. And when you're done, return that back to the center position. Now let's check through here. Notice it says no V-speeds. That indicates a problem with the CDU. 
we're going to check through these instruments here. So no V-speeds in the case there's a problem. So let's go on down here and find out what that problem is. Init ref. Oh, we haven't executed something here, so I will execute this. N1 limit, take off. Just double click through these again. Good. Now we have V-speeds up. You can see V1, 145. So that's all cleared. Standby instruments. Well, the artificial horizon looks like it's in the right place. So that's fine. We'll whiz on over to the first officer, make sure he's got the same barometric pressure, which he does. Now we're not using the RMI today, otherwise we'd do a test on that. So that's all fine. Run through all these warning lights and make sure that they are all out, which they currently are. And then again, back on to testing that switches have the correct covers and so on. So flap inhibit down here, gear inhibit down here, terrain inhibit, they're all covered. We don't have a GPWS warning light, so we're all good there. Our auto brake selector should be RTO at this point, which is rejected takeoff. So if we do need to abort the takeoff, then the auto brake system will help us. N1 set selector should be in auto. A speed reference indicator should be in auto, but we can run through those right now, I think, as well. You see that? So by running through those, we're checking the values down here and making sure that our speed bugs are all set they currently are so we'll put that back into auto with all that done we will reset the fuel flow meter and then we will put it down to rate again back into the pilot flying position clear the caution click on recall we should now see flight flight controls electrics and fuel all as warnings which is expected at this point look on down here speed brake lever should be up Flaps lever should be up, but more importantly, the flaps readout here should match what that is. So the fact that it's up and that's level at zero means we're all good. Parking brake should be on, which it is. Engine start levers, these two should both be in the down position. Our reverses are also down, so we're all good there. And what we can also do, if we're going to be following those things, is we can put a couple of interesting fixes into the CDU to cross-check where we are at as we're flying. So we, the way we do that, click on fix, and the first one is actually that, that Barlow waypoint, which is SSR radial 27. So we'll put in here, Sierra, Sierra, Romeo, the radial, 0, 2, 7, and a slash. We don't care about the distance, put that in here. The next one we're gonna cross-check is Cushy, where we need to be at or above 10,000 feet, and that's on the uh, 311 radial from SSR. So again, three, one one and a slash and we'll put that in there and if we look up in particular if we uh, change my view a little bit and increase the range on this display there you go you can start to see those two green lines which are the radios we just set on our fixes so they're being used for us now as a cross check to make sure we are where we are where we think we are so with all that done, we are into the pushback procedure or before start procedure, which means we need to start getting this aircraft ready to go, which means we're going to need to disconnect the ground power unit. So we're going to need an alternate source of power until the engines come online. That's what the APU is for. So let's go on up here to the APU. First thing we're going to do is on the fuel pumps, we're going to turn on. Oh, actually, I've turned. Look at that. I really screwed up my fuel pumps. They should all be off at this point, except one. I had them in the wrong position. <laughs> Eagle-eyed among you, no doubt, have been typing comments when I did that the first time around. Anyway, now they're correct, all off except for one. Let's start the APU. And that starts the small turbine engine in the back of the aircraft, which is gonna provide us with power. We just need to sit and wait now, watch the exhaust gas temperature start to rise. While we're waiting for that, let's go ahead and finish setting up the MCP. So auto throttle can be armed at this point. I'm not going to worry about LNAV and VNAV just yet. You can see here auto throttle is armed. Let's go on back to the overhead. Exhaust gas temperature came up, now it's dropping down. And after a few moments, you'll see the APU generator off bus light come on. Now again, with those fuel switches, I think it's worth pointing out as well. Speaking to real pilots, sometimes they get things wrong, just like I did, and sometimes they miss things, which is why you tend to have multiple checks on the same item. So I just double checked that prior to starting the APU and noticed that I made a mistake. So there is redundancy in checklists and flows. APU gen off bus is on, so we will turn on the APU generators and we will 
right click to turn off ground power. Just make sure that is off, which it is. And I said that when we turn on the APU, we will double check that we have a dual bleed light on, which we do. So back down here to the CDU, let's go into the menu, FS actions, ground connections, pull the wheel chocks and that will pull everything. So the GPU is now gone away. Put this back on a knit ref, N1 takeoff. And if I look outside now, you'll see that the chocks are gone and the GPU is gone. See, we're all ready to go. Next thing we will check, obviously, is that the doors are all closed. So FS actions, doors. The fact that these all say open means that they're closed. We check the next page. And again, they're all closed. But interestingly, this was pointed out to me on a live stream. If you spend enough time sitting on the ground as I have, you might, I'm not sure if we're going to see it today, you might have one of these door lights come on just because of a change in pressure between the cabin and the outside. You know, uh, not really leaking pressure, but just a, a pressure differential from sitting on the ground for so long. Don't worry about it. Just make sure that as you start to move, and uh, in particular take off that that light does go out. Okay, so running through the checklist. Flight deck door is closed and locked. CDU display has been set and checked. Our N1 bugs, we already checked those. MCP is all good. Taxi and takeoff briefings. Well, we're gonna taxi out to the right, all the way down there to runway 26 in part two of this fully loaded series. We, and then we're gonna take off from runway 26 and follow the ASORT 2 departure, climbing up to 10,000 feet or above at Cushy. That is an absolute requirement and everything else should be just fine. In the event of a failure, I will just edit the video and redo it so you never even know. So with all that done, we can now go ahead and establish contact with the ground crew to actually start our pushback. So, menu, FS actions, pushback. We're gonna turn our nose to the right. We're gonna turn our nose to the right 90 degrees, like so, and click on start. Uh, ground cockpit. Hi, Captain. We're all set to go up here. We've been cleared to push and start at your discretion. Pardon me, ready for push. Power and air is clear, doors closed. We are ready for pushback. Please park the brake, please. So release the parking brake and we'll finish on, finish up getting this aircraft okay, powered up. So on the overhead now, push. fuel panel. We're gonna turn on all the fuel pumps. We do have a little bit of fuel in those center tanks. Not a lot, but we are gonna use it right now. Hydraulic pumps. System A switches all need to go at this point off, like so. System B switches all now need to go on. And then the hydraulic, electric hydraulic pumps, so this one as well, also need to go on. We're all good. Position lights now can go to steady and strobe. Anti-collision light switch should go on at this point. We need to set up our trim, which is 5.33. And I know that because I remember looking at it. But it's actually up there, you can see it right now. That's why we're on the takeoff ref page. So trim down to 5.33, which we can do now that we have hydraulic power running. Back on the overhead, our air conditioning packs now need to go off. So this one, we'll right click and right click. Now our start sequence today is the right engine number is two, then one, so right engine, then left engine. So we will switch that right engine now over to ground, run on down here, and wait for the right engine to hit 20%. Once it hits 20%, we'll introduce fuel by moving this lever up. Like so. We just monitor the engines, make sure everything looks normal, everything's coming up the way it should. You can hear the engine starting up outside. And we're waiting for a click, which is start to cut out. My yoke is kind of moving on its own. Sorry about that. Let's get rid of that if I can. No, I can't. Go away. Go away, yoke. There it goes. Now, start a cutout will be that switch moving out of the ground position. There it goes. So, engine number one. Switch that to ground and the same pattern. Wait for this to reach 20%, at which point we'll introduce fuel. Now. 
Push is complete. Set pressure brake, please. We'll set the brake. All right, brakes are set and uh, pressure is normal. Okay, sir. Tow bar is off. Pin is out. Watch the pin on the right. All right, guys. Thanks. You're cleared to disconnect. We will uh, be watching for the pin and the release from guidance on the right side of the airplane, and uh, we'll see you guys next time through. Roger that. Have a good flight. There's the start of the cutout. So back on the overhead, the generators 1 and 2 now go on. We'll put our AC voltmeter onto Gen 1, or it could go to Gen 2, doesn't matter. Probe heat switches now need to go on. You should see all those orange lights go away. Wing anti-ice and energy anti-ice, we don't need those, so that's just fine. All of system A pumps now need to go on. Low pressure light will go out. The pack switches now need to go to auto. Our isolation valve, which has been in open all this time, now needs to go to auto. APU bleed air switch, this one, can go off. And similarly, the APU can now go off. We'll switch our engine start switches here to continuous by right-clicking them. And then we'll just check down here that these two switches are still in the idle detent, which they currently are. Flaps now. Should be a takeoff flaps, which is flaps 5. So we'll pull the flaps lever down. Five, and you should see flaps transit light come on and once it hits five there's the flaps transit light should come on any second there it goes once it hits flaps five that will go out and this light will come on telling us the leading edge flaps are also extended final thing we can do now check our flight controls now we don't have a sexy display like in the triple seven to show us the flight controls are actually working so I'm going to cheat and go outside so there's the ailerons they're all working great there's the elevator there's the rudder so our flight controls are all good lower display unit now can go to blank that one transponder the new rule in America's transponder now needs to be on ready to move like so. In fact, we'll put it to TA and RA. And we will check recall. We have a fuel light because we got very low fuel in the center tanks. That's just fine. So with all that done, we are ready to taxi and take off. And that will be the end of part one of this video. In part two, we will take off. We will taxi. And I'll show you why you have all those waypoint and uh, blank spaces next to the waypoints in your flight plan. What you should be doing when you're climbing and cruising and uh, hopefully we won't need to adjust anything but what to do to adjust if you are finding that you're under fuel or behind schedule so until next time my name is frugal thank you so much for watching and i'll see you all very soon